I think because it forms the foundation of a lot of the things that they need to do. So um, foundationally, you're looking at creating your messaging, you're looking at defining your audiences, you're looking at um, how you want to take your message out, who you want to influence. And so that has value far beyond just what people may consider to be public relations, which is media coverage. Um, it's also a really important um, vehicle for, as I said, the executives who need to be the front and center for the company. And it allows you to test your message with stakeholders and figure out what people are thinking about you. So it's a two-way conversation as compared to something like advertising, perhaps that's one way. Well, you know, we know from research that credibility and reputation is as important as product, service, and support. So if you're not always thinking about your reputation, you do yourself a great disservice. So I think startups, no matter what stage they're in, have to think about their reputation and have to have that in the back of their mind. Does that mean they have to do a full-blown public relations campaign? No. Uh, but they do have to be thinking about their messages and the face they're going to take to the market when they're ready. So if you want to tell your corporate story, there are a lot of documents that you have to create, but there are some priority ones. I mean, the first, I think, message for um, an entrepreneur is you don't have to practice PR by the pound. The press kit can be just a few documents, such as a corporate backgrounder, some executive bios, a product fact sheet. These are really the most essential documents that can help tell your corporate story. The first thing the entrepreneur needs to do is really take a step back, look at the opportunity and examine if it'll make a difference in their business, if it will really help them in terms of marketing their product long term or making sure that uh, it's positioned properly. So take a step back and re-examine your messaging. So if you need to develop some or review it, make sure that that key messaging really reflects the positioning that you want for your product as well as the key attributes and the value proposition it delivers. Reviewing that will really make a difference in terms of how effectively you communicate with that global journalist. So that's the key thing. Messaging is first, and then secondly, I would actually learn a little bit about the reporter. Find out what's uh, of interest to them. Find out what they've written about in the past so you can sort of get a sense of you know, what questions they might ask you in terms of specifics about the product. If you do that, I think uh, you'll really have a much more successful interview. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, my name is Carrie Damon. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Education um, here at Mars, and I'm just going to do the intros today in Tony's, um, Tony's place. Um, I just wanted to do a quick thank you to our sponsor, CIBC. So our, our Entrepreneurship 101 program is generously supported by CI, CIBC, so we're very grateful to them. And I have a quick announcement about an upcoming business competition. Uh, we had a slide, but we've, oh, we got it. Um, this is actually a, a, a conference and a competition that's coming up quite quickly. Uh, you'll see on the bottom, there's the, um, the website address for the National Business and Technology Conference. There is a, an entrepreneurship competition um, that has quite uh, some, some great prizes that you see there, a $30,000 um, business advisory services from Mars, Blackberry Torches, Global Mail coverage. Um, the preliminary deadline is actually this Sunday, so um, it's coming up quite quickly, and others might be interested in attending it. Uh, the conference itself, it's March 18th and 19th here at Mars. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, who is Mark Evans. Uh, Mark is actually a first-time speaker here at Entrepreneurship 101. This uh, lecture is a new lecture that we've added this year based on sort of your feedback and the importance of marketing communications to startups. startups. Um, Mark Evans is, uh, he is a, a digital marketing content and social media strat strategist who works with startups and fast-growing companies to help them tell a compelling story to their audiences. Um, you might have read, uh, he's also a technology writer and has been writing for um, 
a different media for over 10 years. You might read his uh, twice a week online column in the Globe and Mail. He also writes for the National Post, Bloomberg News, and he writes uh, several blogs as well, including the Mark Evans Tech and Sysmos blog on the Sysmos blog. And he's also one of the founders of Mesh, which is a huge, um, very exciting, sort of Canada's leading web conference, which happens in May. May, yeah, I was thinking it's coming up pretty quick. So it is with, uh, we're very grateful to have Mark here, and I'd like to welcome him to the stage to, to discuss marketing communications for startups. Well, thanks for coming. I uh, really appreciate the fact there's so many of you here. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna uh, talk about today um, is marketing, um, and I thought about, well, what's the theme for this topic? This is the first time I've actually done um, a real marketing focused uh, presentation. A lot of the things I've been talking about recently are social media. I mean, social media, everyone talks about social media these days, but I think one of the things about social media the thing that, that dawns on me, it is just a marketing tool. And when I was thinking about the focus for today's presentation, uh, I thought, well, maybe there's a singular focus here, something that I can really hone in on. And then I thought, no, and that's not it at all, because what I'm going to do is talk about a whole bunch of things, a whole gambit of marketing initiatives. Because I think one of the fallacies of marketing is that people think that there's a silver bullet. That if you do one thing really well, if you're an entrepreneur or a startup, then that'll lead to marketing success. And the reality is it doesn't work that way. Is that you have to do lots of different things. And some more successful than others. Uh, some you have to recalibrate and some are complete failures. But it's that mix, that variety, that keeps you going, that allows you to gain traction so that in time you'll get marketing success. And I'm not just talking the talk because I also walk the walk. Two years ago, after losing my job during the economic downturn working for a startup, uh, I sort of stumbled into being an entrepreneur and I started my own consulting business. So in the last two years, I've sort of immersed myself in self-branding and marketing. So a lot of the things I'm talking about today are things that I do every single day. I never let up on the gas when it comes to marketing. I remember the lesson that I learned straight out was um, after a couple months um, of starting my business, I, got a, I was doing some, you know, lots of networking and things like that. I got lots of business and then I stopped marketing. And then when that work ended in about a month, I realized the pipeline was empty. And you know what it's like when you got a mortgage to pay and you got kids at home and there was a sense of panic. And it taught me that your marketing activity, you can never let up the gas. I mean, that's the reality. It's a lot of work sometimes. It's not that glamorous as it might seem, but it's the way of the world. You really have to do it. So I'm going to cover a lot of different material today. Um, a couple of rules before we get going. If you have questions during the presentation, don't be afraid to ask. Apparently, there are microphones um, in the audience so that they can record you asking the question. Uh, the slide show is going to be available um, after the talk, so you, you can write notes, but you don't have to take furious notes. Um, and uh, so let's get going. So one of the things you have to just remember when you're getting into marketing, thinking about marketing, is what do you want to do it for? Like eventually, what is the whole uh, purpose of all this activity? Is it sales? Is it leads? Is it a better brand? Is it better customer service? Like, what is the end result? What does success look like? when you're doing marketing. Because often a lot of people sort of launch themselves into a marketing program and they do all kinds of things but they don't know what the end result is. And if you don't know where you're going, you can't measure how, what you're doing, right? Pretty simple proposition. So the one thing I want to stress when you're thinking about marketing and you're thinking about what you want to do is what you want to get out of it, right? Because if you're doing certain activities and it doesn't sort of lead to the result you want, then you're wasting your time. So, the biggest question, and I think this is the fundamental question when it comes to marketing for being an entrepreneur, is you have to decide who you are. Now, the reality is it's easier said than done. Now, when I was thinking about what I was doing, this is no, I'm not exaggerating at all, it took me a year to get down to the point where I said, I am a digital marketing content and social media strategist. And if you took a look at my WordPress, which is the way I run my website, there's probably dozens of iterations where I was trying to reinvent myself every day and just couldn't find it, right? So it's often referred to, to, refer to as core messaging. And that was during one of the uh, videos, uh, they often talked about the importance of core messaging because if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you stand for and why you exist, then the customer's not gonna know. And if you can't do that, then it's a fail right out of the gate. Too many companies 
have no clue about how to properly articulate who they are and why anybody should care. So when I was a reporter, uh, I spent 10 years as a technology reporter with the Globe and Mail and the Financial Post, and I would interview these companies on the phone. They'd get very excited, and they'd ramble on for five minutes about the paradigm shift in their technology and the solutions that they would offer and the enterprise you know, um, offerings they had, and they went on and on and on. And then after they took a deep breath, I'd say, okay, listen, I've been covering technology for 10 years. I'm pretty literate when it comes to sort of the vernacular, and I have no idea what you just told me. Can you say it in English? And then they'd go, well, our widget does this. And I'd say, well, why didn't you do that in the first place? So as, a tech, you know, as entrepreneurs, we get so excited. We're so close to the fire. We're so into what we're doing. We often forget the fact that you have to think of the consumer, right? It's not about what you're saying about your products. It's what you need to say to the consumers. What do they need to know about your products and your services? That's fundamental. So you have to explain, so what do you do? What is the product that you're making? What is the services that you're offering? Pretty simple, right? Don't dance around. Be very clear and right to the point. What problem do you solve? So the only reason people are gonna to come to you is that you're gonna do something for them. It's the fundamental question. What's in it for me? What's in it for me, the customer? You have to answer that. What does your product do? or your service do that solves a problem or helps them do something that they weren't able to do before or makes their lives easier. It's all about delighting the customer. So if you don't explain that, then that's a fail too. And the final thing, what's in it for me? Think of, think of yourselves in the customer's shoes. What are you gonna give them? How are you gonna make their lives easier, their businesses better, their lives more profitable? And often the best way to find out is to ask them if you've got customers or use third parties to give you perspective. Because often we lose perspective when it comes to marketing because we're so into our product. We're so into what we're doing, what we think our vision is, that we lose track of what's going on. And what I often say, the ultimate test subject, if you're gonna see whether your marketing messaging and your core messaging is on, fat, on track, whoops, is the mother test, right? This is my mom. So my mom is a Luddite, right? <laughs> she doesn't really understand what I do. Uh, it was better when I was a newspaper reporter because she reads newspapers and that was good. But now that I deal with technology companies, she doesn't get it, right? So I have to be very clear about I do this and the way that I help customers is this and then success for them is this. And she goes, yeah. So when you think about what you're doing in your businesses, go ask your mom, right? You're having dinner on a Sunday night and she says, how's business going? Or say, hey, listen, I want to tell you about my new venture. If she has that glazed look on her face, kind of giving you that look, you know? then you failed. But if she gets it, if your mother gets it, and I'm probably deprecating all mothers out there, then you've actually scored, right? So that's the ultimate test. And what you get when you get core messaging down, when you've passed the mother test, when you understand what your product is, the problem you're solving, and what's in it for your customer, then what you've established is a good foundation. And the foundation allows you to do social media in a very effective way. You can do marketing, you can do business development, you can do sales, you can do investor relations, you can seek investment. Because you've got that core, right? That thing that you can look at and go, this is who we are. And everybody within the company can sing off the same hymn page. And so that's why core messaging, I think when it comes to marketing, is the foundation of your, of your house, right? Is that if you can get this down, you can do anything else. It's the elevator pitch too. You know, often we have very little time to explain to people what we do and why they should care. So the elevator pitch is being able to tell somebody what you do in 30 seconds and for them to go, right, I get it. And so what you're aiming for with the elevator pitch is you're looking for permission to give them more information. So if you can get through this hurdle, they go, hey, that's interesting. Well, tell me some more. That's the ultimate success story out there. If your elevator pitch fails, then that's it, end of conversation. And the other thing that's really important is competitive positioning when we think of marketing. So it's not just your marketing, but it's your marketing compared to other companies out there. So what are they saying? What's their core messaging? How are they positioning their products and services versus what you're doing? Maybe they're doing a better job. Maybe they're using different uh, marketing vehicles. Maybe they've leveraged social media or they're into direct mail or they're into email. But if you're going to look at core messaging and you're going to look at your market initiatives, you really have to look at the competitive landscape and see where you fit into the scheme of things. 
Maybe there's an opportunity in social media, for example, to really get into Facebook because the com competition isn't there yet or they're not doing it well. But one of the ultimate goals is to say, okay, this is where we sit in the competitive landscape. So examples of some companies that have really nailed core messaging. So you have a very crystal clear idea of what they do. So Netflix, how many Netflix customers in the house? All right, fair amount. So essentially, it's watch as many movies as you can. Now, the problem with Netflix when it comes to Canada is the movies are kind of old, uh, which has been a bit of an issue for them. Um, but for $7.99 a month, I mean, what do we expect? Um, but th it's very clear about what you get with Netflix. Now, obviously, this is a Mars favorite. Fresh books, people, anybody fresh books customers out there? So if you're running your own business and you do any kind of invoicing, I should get a commission for this, but you should use FreshBooks. It's the way that I run my business. It's super simple, uh, very effective. It's a great way of tracking not only your invoices, but your expenses. And they're Canadian. They're based right here in Toronto. And there's more than a million users around the world. It's probably one of Canada's uh, biggest online success stories. And again, there's no mystery about what FreshBooks does. And then Mint, which recently came to Canada. Essentially, this is the best free and easy way to manage your money. Down, right? That's it. You know what they do. The other thing that we should talk about when it comes to marketing is your website. You know, one of the things about uh, social media, and in particular Facebook, is that uh, people have fallen in love with everything, the shiny new things out there, and they forget about their websites. And I often think of a website as being the workhorse. It's not sexy, it's not dynamic, you don't change that often, hopefully not that often, but it really, again, forms the foundation for who you are as a company and the messages that you want to communicate to your target audiences, which leads again to your marketing activity. And so I think that people should pay lots of attention to their website. It should be very, uh, it's the place where people know who you are and what they want to get from you. And you can't ignore it, right? You can't think of it, well, it's not a, as good as social media anymore. It's not effective. You know, I can just put one together and it doesn't matter. I think websites deserve a lot of love and attention. The writing has to be great. The presentation and design have to be terrific because it's your face to the world these days. And so there are three things that are really important when it comes to marketing and using your website. One is the home page because often this is the only page that people are going to visit. And the reality of the web right now is no one reads anymore. We all scan. And if we don't see what we want right away, we leave. And so not only does your home page have to be crystal clear and articulate what you do and why people should care, but people want instant gratification. They don't want to work it. Like people are lazy when it comes to the internet. I hate to say that. It's that we want it now, we want it right away, and we don't want to click around or do any work. We just want you to give it to us now. The other thing is there can't be any grit. And I describe grit as those little tiny sort of hurdles that people put in the way of consumers doing things. So it could be that extra click that you have to make that you really don't want to make, or it could be that your navigation isn't very good and you have to hunt around and find things. It could be that people are looking for your about us section and they can't find it or the FAQ. Anything that gets in the way of the consumer experience, whether it's communications or marketing, they'll leave you. So remember, make it easy, make it simple. People are lazy. They don't want to work, right? They just want it to be given to them on a silver platter. Clear calls to action, right? You want anybody to do anything, whether from a marketing perspective or from a sales perspective, then tell them or point in really large letters, hey, do this right now, right? Because again, the laziness factor is that you almost have to sort of lead the horse to water and you have to make the horse drink. So if you don't tell them what you want them to do, they won't do it. And user-friendly navigation. You know, it's funny because some websites are like sort of mazes, right? They, they kind of like want you to fool around and go to the bottom and go to the top. And some of them are really funky with lots of flash and videos and things like that. And it really gets confusing. And all I want to do is find stuff and I want to find it really easily and I want to find it quickly. Otherwise, the competition is just a click away. The other section that's really important is about us. And the about us is basically a riff on your core messaging. You take your core messaging, you fluff it up a little bit about your management team and where you're located and maybe the investment that you've got and you put it on there. People ignore the about us. And I've seen dozens and dozens of examples of companies with terror about, about us because I can't tell what they do and why I should care. And if you can't answer those questions, then it's game over. So don't ignore your about us. It really is the place where people want to know that mini snapshot 
of what you do, who you are, and where you're located. And it goes a long, long way. And finally, a pet peeve of mine, contact us. So when I click on contact us, I expect to be able to contact people, but you know what really drives me crazy? Is those forms, you know, or you get an email address that says info at, you know, abc.com. I, I want a person, right? I want, I want to be able to visit you. I want to be able to phone you. I want to be able to go to your office, maybe. Um, I want to be able to mail you a letter or send you a fax. So this is a good about us. It basically gives you every piece of information you may need to know about the company. And, they don't and it's all there, right? All the communication avenues and all the mediums where they exist are right there. So the three big things, your homepage, your about us, and your contact us. You nail those on your website and you're good to go. The other thing that's really interesting from a marketing perspective is data. Um, and anybody here into Google Analytics or things like that? Okay, so Google Analytics is essentially like it's a free gem from Google. And if you really get into Google Analytics and some of the information that it displays uh, and you customize it sort of to what you want to do, then there's a wealth of information that can really um, start to influence your marketing decisions, where you're going to focus your efforts, um, the kind of markets that you're going to focus on, the kind of geographies that you're going to focus on. And I saw a really good example of, of data um, in the New York Times on Sunday. Everybody read this story on Igniter in the business section of the New York Times? Okay. So um, anybody dating in the room? Anybody date in the room? Anybody group date in the room? So <laughs> probably the wrong demographic. Is that, is that a personal question? So Igniter was a, is a, it's a company based in New York City. And it's all about group dating, this idea that, you know, people don't date anymore, you know, they go on group dates and it's more comfortable and it's easier that way. So they had this great concept that they would uh, launch this service where somebody could organize a group date and they'd communicate with their friends and they'd go out in this date. And they did pretty well. Um, after a couple of years, they had about 50,000 registered users, which in the scheme of things is not that bad. But they started looking at their analytics and they started to notice that there was increasing traffic from India. And then there was more traffic from India and more traffic from India. And they were like, hey, what's going on here? Like, like, we're getting more growth in India in a month than we've got in the States in two years. And so they started to dig into this traffic, which they never really noticed what was going on. And they realized that in India, you know, with the way that, you know, you, couples are arranged marriages and dating is sort of very, sort of, uh, it's not like Western dating, is that group dating is, a, is an amazing phenomenon right there. And so right now they have two million customers, 95% of them are India, and they're actually opening offices in India and hiring Indian employees. And this is something they would never have discovered if they hadn't paid attention to their data. So again, a lot of what you can get in terms of intelligence and insight can come from your data. So don't uh, ignore your data, delve into your data, become a Google Analytics expert, because there's a wealth of information out there that can really start to sway a lot of the decisions that you make. And the big thing is social media when it comes to marketing. So one of the things I got to stress when it comes to social media, and I, and I do a lot of business in social media and I help companies use social media. So it's a big part of what I do, but it's not the best thing since sliced bread. It's not going to solve all your marketing problems. It's not going to jumpstart your sales. It's not going to improve your customer service. And it's not going to rescue your brand or make your brand you know, shinier and better than everybody else. It will help along with all the other marketing things that you're doing, but it's not the single thing. And so if you put all your bets on social media, then you're basically cutting off your nose to spite your face. I think social media is very useful if you leverage it in the right way, um, but don't think it's the cat's meow and that it can do everything for you, because it won't. So when it comes to social media, I mean, there's no lack of things out there that entrepreneurs can use to leverage uh, what they're doing. So I used to have MySpace up here, but MySpace is basically irrelevant. Um, I think the starting point for a lot of entrepreneurs when it comes to social media is LinkedIn. Everybody have a LinkedIn account here? We all on LinkedIn? Anybody not on LinkedIn? Anybody going to admit they're not on LinkedIn? Okay, you got to get on LinkedIn. It's like the resume. I don't know. It's like, do you remember when you had a resume? Anybody have a resume anymore? Okay. <laughs> but you know when you're really worried about whether the paper was really perfect, you know, and had the right tone and everything? Well, I don't worry about that anymore because we're on LinkedIn these days, or we have personal websites. But the, all the other things are really interesting these days, and what you've got to really decide is what's for you. 
So from a marketing perspective, and also from a sales perspective, what tool is going to give you the, bang for the best bang for the buck? Where are the target audiences? So in terms of your customers, are they using Twitter? Are they on Facebook? Um, you know, do they read blogs? That kind of thing. Now personally, I've been blogging since 2004. Probably written about 7,500 blog posts, but I'm a writer by profession. So for me, I guess that's a lot, but seems like the right thing to be doing. But for entrepreneurs, I think the blogs are probably uh, the most powerful uh, marketing uh, and sales tool you can use only because what you're trying to do is establish your stature and your domain expertise. You're kind of trying to become an opinion leader and the best way to demonstrate that on a regular basis is to blog. Now a lot of people that I do business with they'll check me out on LinkedIn, maybe they'll go to my, my website to see the services that I offer and then they'll check out my blog and what I'm trying to do with the blog is demonstrate hey I know what I'm talking about. I've got some pretty good insight. Uh, you know, I've got a, a good perspective on where the marketplace is going so that it's all about the comfort level. Is that customers these days, we're still pretty tight with their money and they want to feel good about spending money on a product or service. So anything that you can do to boost their confidence or enhance your own credibility is a good thing in terms of a marketing uh, pursuit. And I think blogs are a really excellent way to establish yourself, particularly if you don't have a big marketing budget or you have no marketing budget because the barriers to entry are simply time and the energy that you're willing to put into it and the ideas that you come up with. So one of the things that I want to stress when it comes to social media is that we often talk about how the tools are free and that, hey, we can do all this social media marketing and it won't cost us any money. And I mentioned the fact that, you know, it's not magical. But the reality is that that's not free, is that social media takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of energy, and that you gotta work it all the time. And that if you commit yourself to social media, success is a matter of inches at a time, not miles at a time. And that progress happens over weeks and months as opposed to overnight. And I just wanna basically sort of calibrate you in the right way when it comes to taking the right approach to social media. So the benefits of social media from a marketing perspective. So you've got competitive intelligence in terms of what is the competition doing, what are the new products out there, what are some of the features that are coming out that you may have to think about. Feedback from customers in terms of what do they want, what are they thinking about, what kind of marketing initiatives are resonating with them. Thought leadership, when I mentioned, when it comes to a blog. Customer service, always an excellent marketing activity. Media and PR relations and content creation. And some of the key considerations when you're thinking about social media. So one, target audience. As I mentioned, you gotta think about, so what is the consumer doing? What social media services are they using right now? Because if you're all over Facebook and you create a really bang whiz Facebook page and none of your consumers or potential consumers are on Facebook, then you're wasting your time. The same goes for Twitter. They're sexy and they're very glamorous, but it's all about the target audience and meeting their needs as opposed to what you wanna use. Resources. As I said, social media takes a lot of time and effort, so you've got to commit the resources or make them available to do social media. If you don't have enough resources, and one of the biggest problems or biggest challenges when you're an entrepreneur is not enough time, and so you've got to figure out, do I have enough time for social media? Do I, should I be allocating some of my resources to social media away from biz dev or sales or other marketing activities? Bang for the buck, again, right, ROI. Everything you do when you're an entrepreneur is about, is there an ROI on this? Is there a return on my investment? I'm gonna get, gonna get something out of this thing. What's the competition doing? You know, if you're looking at a marketing edge or a marketing advantage, if the competition is all over social media, then you might think of having to do something different to get into that marketplace. But if they're not doing social media, then there's a huge marketing opportunity for you to do something good. And the thing about social media is whatever you do, do it as well as you can. A big mistake that a lot of companies make is they get into social media and they do everything. They have a YouTube channel and a Twitter account and they're on a Facebook page and they have a blog and what inevitably happens is they do all of it pretty badly and then it just reflects badly and to be perfectly honest they might as well not do it at all. And so what I often suggest when you're thinking about social media is start with one thing, you know, whether it's a Facebook page or a blog and just do that one thing as well as you can and resonate it with your, with your customers and improve it and 
Think of ways that you can promote it all the time. And once you get comfortable and once you see some traction, then think about the second thing. So maybe your Facebook page has a thousand fans. And then you're thinking, this is pretty good. Maybe I should maybe do some Twitter. But don't run before you walk. Take your time, recognize that you've got a certain amount of resources available to you, and you don't want to spread yourself too thin in any activity that you do, and this includes social media. The other element that's, uh, any PR people in the house before I get into it, because I'm gonna, okay. Well, I apologize for what I'm gonna say, but anyway. Um, rule number one, PR does not equal media and blog coverage. So I, I, one of the things that used to drive me crazy is that a company would hire a PR firm and then they'd instantly expect media coverage. I pay you money, you get me media coverage. Well, it doesn't work that way. Is that PR is as much art as science. Is that there's no sort of secret formula that if we write, do the right pitch at the right time and approach the right reporters, we'll get coverage. It doesn't work that way. You know, PR is a combination of luck and timing and a good story and finding a reporter just happens to be on deadline and they're desperate for an idea. It, that's just the way of the world. And it also has to do with relationships. You know, reporters and bloggers are just like everybody else out there. They have friends and they like helping their friends and doing things for people that they like hanging around with. So if you build relationships with media and with, with the bloggers, then your marketing messages and your communication messages have a better chance of resonating with them. You know, the number of emails that a reporter would get or a blogger would get from startups or entrepreneurs looking for coverage, dozens, right? Most of them go right to the trash bin because there's no connection. You know, you haven't related to what the reporter is saying. And second, don't hire a PR agency. Sorry for the PR people in the room. You know, one of the things about PR is it's expensive and that you're essentially hiring talented people and paying them pretty healthy money to do things for you when you really should be sort of thinking about, is this a good investment at this point in time? Because often you're not ready for PR or you're not ready for a PR agency. You know, when you have some traction, when you have customers, when you're looking to make that big leap, then make the investment in PR. You know, they're looking for revenue. You know, they're looking to make some money off you. And whether you're successful or not, I mean, you know, I don't know. But what you're really doing when you're getting PR is you're really buying the Rolodex, you're buying the relationships, but you gotta have a good story to take advantage of those relationships. So in the meantime, do your own PR. And essentially, you know, establish relationships with bloggers and the media. Create your own stories, write your own press releases, create your own videos, anything you can do that can get you some traction, that can actually sort of start to build stories over time, then you'll be ready for PR. But in the meantime, you've got to do it yourself. It's cost effective. You'll really be amazed by what you can do when you have to do your own public relations, when you've got to promote your own cause. And there's lots of tools out there that you can do to help your PR efforts. So there's Pitch Engine, which essentially is a social um, media press release. So rather than go to MarketWire or CNW and pay them you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars to do a social media press release, then you can do it on Pitch Engine. And there's free versions of the service or there's paid versions. Google Alerts is a great way of finding out what's going on out there. You know, what are some of the big issues of the day that you can be reacting to and be taking advantage of? And then Muckrack is a service that lists all the tweets of reporters. So if you want to search for a particular reporter reporting on a particular topic and reach out to them to do some PR or some marketing, then Muckrack is a great way to reach out to them directly. And the best PR pitch is success. You know, it's, it's really one of these interesting things when I work with startups is they come to me and they go, well, we have a great story. We have this new widget and it's super amazing and it's new and it's better than the competition. But they have no customers. They have no revenue. And they say, we still want to go to talk to reporters or we still want to talk to, you know, go to a trade show or a conference. And they go there and they get zero attention. And they're really disappointed because they're so excited and so enthusiastic about what they're doing. And the reality is, is that People like two types of stories, failure and success. And everything in between is kind of boring, right? So what I often tell uh, a lot of startups is wait till you're successful, wait till you've got customers, wait till you've got some traction that you can turn around and say to the world, hey, look at me. Not only do I have a better mousetrap, but actually I have people who want my mousetrap. And create stories around your success, whether it's marketing stories or whether it's media stories or whether it's sales stories, is that success is 
something that's going to get you over the, over the hump when it comes to your marketing efforts because people want to report on successful ventures. A little bit about branding. You don't have a lot of money for branding when you're an entrepreneur, so that's why we do all these other things, including personal branding. But I think one of the biggest things when it comes to marketing and branding is creativity. And the nice thing about creativity is it doesn't take money to be creative. It just takes a little bit of brainstorming, some energy, some enthusiasm, some good ideas, a bunch of people, and maybe a bottle of wine, and you're good to go, right? <laughs> so, and I've seen lots of examples of companies that have done really well by being super creative with their marketing efforts. And I'll give you a few examples. So anybody have heard of Blendtec? Okay. So this is the company that make industrial blenders, really super duty heavy blenders. And they were looking at what they would do from a marketing perspective because they didn't have big budgets and they didn't have any money. So what they decided to do was make some YouTube videos. And they, their budget for their first video was 20 bucks. And they made a series of videos and this is just one of them. Will it blend? That is the question. I love my new iPad. It does a ton of cool things. But will it blend? That is the question. Doesn't quite fit in the jar, but I can take care of that. No! I knew I could get the iPad in a Blendtec Total Blender. I think I'll press the iBlend button. smoke. Don't breathe this. Ah, that was one tough pad. So a couple of really interesting things about a blend tech. So anyone want to guess sales lift over the last four years because of these commercials? And it's all YouTube. Anybody want to guess? 700%. Uh, number of page view, number of uh, views on uh, YouTube is more than five million, and one of the most interesting things is that now Blendtec is getting companies, consumer companies, saying, "Blend our products." You know, we've got a new camera. Can you please blend it? Which is, <laughs> which is pretty good. I mean, it's the ultimate in marketing success, right? Because they want to take advantage of Blendtec's marketing um, traction. Um, Okay, another example of a company that I actually happen to work for, and I made this video, which is one of the reasons I'm showing it, is that one of the things about entrepreneurs is they talk about their companies, but they don't talk about their people. And you don't give your company personality. And that's one of the things that can differentiate you from a marketing perspective is that there are people that work for a business. So what we did with Sysmos, which does social media monitoring and analytics, is that we decided to do um, a riff on the fact that people mangle the name and that it's funny the way that people mispronounce it and the fact that we don't often don't correct them because that would be embarrassing. So we went out in the streets of Toronto in July, 35 degrees outside, and, uh, and spent about 500 bucks to make this video. Sasemos. Sisomos. Sisomos? Sisomos? Sisomos. Sismosis? Like systemosis, sismosis? Sisomos? Sisomos. 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 Sisomos? Sisomos. That's what I'm going with. Sisomos. Sisomos. Sisomos? Sisomos. Yeah. Sisomos. Sisomos. I'm so hungry for it. Sisomos. You could just tell us. That would help. Sisomos. Sis. 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 S
Sissimos. I think it's Sissimos. Sissimos, okay. Sissimos! <laughs> Sissimos! 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 <laughs> Is something silent? So, the nice thing, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, my first and only production effort. Uh, the nice thing about a video is that you can use it for marketing purposes, but you can also use it for business development. You can show it at conferences, you can show it at sales. So this video, you know, it's about 1,500 views on YouTube, which isn't a lot in the scheme of things, but we show it at conferences all the time. And it's a great icebreaker when it comes to introducing the company and showing them a little personality because social media monitoring and analytics isn't that very sexy when you think about it. Um, but this is one way that we show who we are and what we do. Um, and another example that I want to show you is Idea Paint. Anybody use Idea Paint? Anybody use whiteboards? Anybody? So, um, Idea Paint is instead of buying a whiteboard, you actually paint your wall. And you can then use it as a, uh, as a whiteboard. Can I ask you a question about the video that you just showed? Absolutely. So, when you were explaining about how to use the video to capture an audience, to explain what the company did, right. it wasn't clear to me by watching the video about Sysimos. Uh, what the company did at the end. I mean, it was amusing, um, but I, I didn't understand that. You're, you're hurting me. <laughs> okay, uh, well, maybe I, maybe I lied earlier on, but I think that maybe the answer to that is that, you know, sometimes you don't have to be, everything doesn't have to be completely obvious and blatant, is that some of the things that you do may be just riffs or, or just fun. And I think marketing can be fun. Um, it doesn't have to be serious all the time and describe what you do and why we matter and why anybody should care. Uh, but I think that this, you've got to think of this video in the scheme of the other things that the company does. So we've got the one-pagers and we've got the white papers and we do the social media reports and we've got the, you know, the, the product videos. Um, and so it's sort of part of an overall package. Um, and I think that, that one of the keys to marketing is, is variety, is that um, you can do things that are very straight ahead, um, and very corporate and very sort of traditional marketing. And then you can do things that are different. And I think different works, especially if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to capture somebody's attention. Now maybe, to your point, at the end, we should have explained what Sysimos does. You know, um, because I think you're probably right when somebody, if somebody sort of stumbled across the video, they'd know idea who we are, unless they went to your website. But I mean, it's a good point. And uh, next time I make a video, I'll remember that. Anybody else? Okay, so Idea Paint, um, they spent five years developing this product and they released it a couple years ago and it's very, very successful. And so the video that I'm gonna show you is their attempt at explaining in very simple English how they do their social media marketing. And one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do is really break things down into things that are easily understood when it comes to explaining who they are and, and what they do. Hi. I'm Marcus Wilson, the Chief Marketing Officer for IdeaPaint. IdeaPaint is an industry leader in dry erase solutions that foster creativity and collaboration at work, home, and school. Social media is integral to everything we do here at IdeaPaint. It allows us to interact and engage with customers or potential customers in ways that were just not possible a few years ago. We're able to answer questions, solve problems, and just be social. It's also a cost-effective way for us to expand our footprint globally as well as monitor and measure our online reputation and the effects of our marketing efforts all real time. We integrate social media in all of our touch points, marketing, advertising, and even the sales process. Because at the end of the day, social media is a powerful sales tool. The way we approach it here at IdeaPaint is first with content. We develop meaningful and relevant content to our end customer. We take that content and then we post it to YouTube and Flickr, combine that with the editorial of our blog, it gets pushed out to social sites like Twitter and Facebook, which in turn drive more traffic back to the blog. We take all these activities and funnel those towards landing pages, which begins the lead nurturing process. All the landing pages are targeted, and if at the end of the day we're doing this all the right way, we end up with happy customers. So how do we measure the effectiveness of these efforts? 
Well, from a quantitative perspective, there's, you know, there's web traffic, there's leads, and there's sales. Uh, but from a qualitative perspective, there's also effectiveness of engagement and quality of engagement with the end consumer. We find tools like HubSpot, Google, Social Mention, and other tools like that to be very helpful in our overall evaluation of social media. And that's how social media is impacting business here at IdeaPaint. So again, not a very expensive project, unlike what we did in the Sysmos video, we actually explained what the company does. And again, very effective marketing. Lots of views of this video, you know exactly how they operate. They're providing some insight into the way that they do business. And it's just another way of doing marketing. And some of the tools that you can use if you want to do some branding and some marketing without actually spending money, things like 99designs and Crowdspring are very great ways to get logos done. You can get a professional logo for three or four hundred dollars. I don't know if anybody's had any experiences with one of these, but I've had clients that have paid basically nothing to have a professional logo done. And there's ODES as a way of outsourcing some of your marketing activity. So there's lots of really inexpensive or free tools out there um, that you can leverage when you're thinking about how do we allocate resources towards marketing without spending a lot of money. And another sort of interesting marketing initiative is giving away your insight. Um, and here are some of the ways that you can do it. Um, and the company that I work with, with Sysmos, so Sysmos does no marketing. We do no advertising. We don't go to conferences. We don't sponsor conferences. But what they do is they create these social media reports. You know, how many people are using Twitter um, in different countries around the world? How many Facebook pages are there? Who are the most popular celebrities on Facebook? Um, what are the most um, popular um, software clients or websites to use Twitter. And so we publish these reports on a month to month basis or a, every couple of months basis. And we get tremendous traction, like tens of thousands of views and, and lots of news coverage and lots of media coverage and lots of blog coverage. And it costs almost nothing to produce. And what we're doing is essentially we're creating stories and we're giving away the data that we have inside our company. And it's a tool that I suggest that a lot of companies think about because what, what we're looking for is something different. We're all looking for news, right? The media and bloggers are always looking for some insight or a different slice of thing, whether you do a survey or whether you've got data that you're collecting that sort of shows some trends or things like that. But think about reports or white papers for that matter that provide insight. So you're giving stuff away and it does take some work to put together, but the marketing benefits and the attention that you can attract um, can be pretty, pretty significant. And finally, I want to talk about sort of two um, old school ways of doing marketing. One of them is coffee. And I know everybody here probably likes coffee, but it's that, that idea that that person to person, one to one, one by one kind of marketing is very, very effective. So when I was starting my own business, you know, so I got laid off in the middle of December and probably between then and the end of February, probably had about 200 cups of coffee because I was out every single day meeting with people and marketing and selling. You know, I'd come home at the end of the day and I'd feel absolutely nauseous. You know, if you've had about four or five Starbucks in one day, you know, until I realized that I didn't have to drink coffee all the time, you know, I could actually have something like tea. But it was that personal connections. And, it, and the thing about when you do this type of marketing and selling is that it's often not the person that you're having coffee with that buys your products or services. It's often they talk about other people that they talk to other people and they say, yeah, I just met this guy and he does social media strategy. And it's that relationships and that network building that often is your most effective personal marketing. Because once people get to know you and they realize who you are and get a feel for whether you're a good person or a bad person or whether you have a good product to sell or a bad product, you can break through a lot of marketing barriers. And I think, you know, in this day of social media um, and digital communications, we often lose sight of the fact that, you know, your personal network and your personal marketing are the most powerful tools we've got. And one of the things I found interesting during the economic downturn was the growth that was seen in LinkedIn. You know, it went from sort of 15 million to 80 million almost overnight. And I think that was the fact that people didn't spend enough time in their personal networks and they tried to cheat by using LinkedIn. So I think you've got to focus on your, on your personal networks and your personal marketing. Yeah, question. Uh, compose uh, sort of who you were in an in a easy sort of short form way in a simple sentence so when you're talking about meeting for coffee with people was this part of the process in being able to develop your professional identity and how were you able to convey 
sort of the ambiguity of where you were at that time while trying to market yourself? So yeah, good question. And so, um, so when I first started, what when I was telling people, what do you do? I, I you know, it's like, like you know, when you go ever go to Denny's and there's like ten pages of choices for breakfast, and you can't pick what you want because there's it's so confusing. That's what I did when I was going out for the first time. I can do everything. I can write website content. I can do social media. I can blog. I can do Twitter for you. I can market for you. I did everything, and they and they kind of you could see their eyes glaze over. It's like, oh, geez. Right? And so what that was, it was, it was testing, right? So the next time I met with somebody, I said, well, I can do f six things, and it still didn't work. And then I said, I got down to three things, and maybe that wasn't so. And then I got down to like two things. And that's what eventually what I eventually boiled it down to. And so I said two things, and when, they, when I only said two things, as opposed to like 15 things, they went, huh, I get that. And then they'd say, well, tell me more. And then I'd say, well, I also do this. So a lot of what I did, that process, was almost like, it was almost like trying to s distill what I wanted to offer. And what I ended up doing was, by getting my focus very, very tight, I got a wedge in the door. And then when you ask, people start talking to you and sort of listening to what you have to say, and you start listening to what they have to say, then you can start solving some of their other problems. But it's often hard to get that connection if they don't really know what you do. So I, it's just a, I think it was a sense of, of sort of testing and retesting and recalibrating. And, and I was, I'm serious, but it took a year. I mean, and when I finally got to the point where, yep, that works. Um, but um, it's, it, it, often you're just trying to hone it till you feel that it's the right thing to do. Um, so coffee, good thing. I still do a lot of it. And business cards. Anybody, anybody not use business cards anymore? <laughs> okay, one person in the house, you're a brave guy. Uh, I guess we'll be exchanging business cards at the end of the uh, presentation. And I still think that, you know, I, we talk about old school, we talk about personal connections, we talk about personal marketing, and I still think that business cards are really, really super valuable um, because, you know, you can, you can bump on your iPhone and you can send me a V card and you can, you know, try to remember my website address, but business cards are tangible. And what we're looking for when we're doing marketing, especially when you're an entrepreneur, is those personal connections. And I can't stress enough the fact that people will remember you and they'll resonate with you. When you're at a party and they, and they go home or they go back to their office and they pull out their, their business cards and they've got a whole collection, they go, oh, look, Mark Evans, look at that guy. As opposed to you know, meeting a dozen people at a meeting and they'll just forget you. And so it seems old school, but it's really still a very valid way to do business. And I think what it says is that Marketing is a multi sort of pronged beast and that it's not the one thing that'll give you sort of instant success or be the, and you only should focus on one thing, you should focus on lots of things. And I think, you know, just as I was trying to experiment to see who I was and the services that I offered, is that I often experiment with marketing. You know, some things work. You try it out, they work really well. You try other things, they don't work well. And over time, you'll find, as you experiment and you feel things out, is that some things work better than others. And so I think what I want to leave you with in terms of my presentation um, is the fact that marketing isn't scary. Um, marketing often doesn't mean that it happens overnight um, and that you can be wildly successful without really trying that hard. It's a lot of work, um, but it, it really comes down to making a commitment and figuring out where your target audiences are and what the best tools are to do the job. And the last thing is that never stop. Never stop marketing yourself or your company is that as soon as you stop and you let off the gas, then that's when things get away from you. And that marketing is a day in, day out activity. It takes a lot of work and time, but at the end of the day, hopefully you're successful. Anyway, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, in the front. You can go ahead. Why don't you okay, go ahead. great. Thanks, thanks, Mark, for your presentation. Terrific. Um, I just wonder if you could, uh, if you've heard of um, the idea of um, inbound marketing. Right. Yeah, and, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit about, and you've touched on it already, blogs, media, and, and I just wonder if you, if you see that as something that's going to have traction. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody, has anybody read Inbound Marketing by Dharmesh Shah? So if, you, if you're going to read one business book this year, it's, it's that book, and Dharmesh is D-H-A-R-M-E-S-H, -E and S-H-A-H. -H. And it's like 20 bucks, and it's a great read. You can read it in a weekend or read it on the GO train. 
It's really simple, but it really talks about inbound marketing. And I think that you know, whatever we're doing, and, and this includes social media, it's all about inbound marketing. And that's why, you know, and I stressed earlier about the importance of your website, because you want to get people to go someplace. And the place often these days is your website, unless you've also sort of got a very active Facebook page. And so your web page really has to um, satisfy people when you drive them to there. There has to be sort of something you're going to give them. And it could be like Idea Paint, you know, creating special landing pages based on your marketing efforts, or it could be just having a really great home page or a really great about us page. Um, but inbound marketing is a great activity, but it only works if you've, at the end of the day, you give them what they want or what they expect. But yeah, I think it's, it's especially for the web, it's, it's all about inbound marketing. Yeah. Um, hi, Mark. Um, just a quick question. Um, sorry, I'm a bit uh, shaky, but um, you mentioned that uh, you don't need PR support or PR help from professionals. Uh, you also mentioned that you don't need uh, design help or anything from professionals. So are you recommending that as entrepreneurs, people just uh, go out on their own? Uh, just judging from my experience as an entrepreneur that an entrepreneur you're so busy doing what you need to do in order to get your business to go. Um, I wonder if it makes a lot of sense to spend as much time doing all these other pieces of work that other entrepreneurs out there or PR people or design people can help you with. Right. Um, so it really comes down to sort of resource allocation and what you've got the money for and what you've got the time for. And if you've got the money to outsource some of those activities, then yeah, definitely hire um, design people or PR people. But I think one of the things that really has helped me in my business is, is trying to reach out to people who are like me um, who are entrepreneurs like me, so if it's a designer or a PR person, I'd rather deal with somebody who sort of feels my pain or feels the experiences that I do um, because they're entrepreneurs too and there's often you have a better relationship with them because they're, they, they're in your shoes as well as opposed to going to a big PR, PR agency that really doesn't know how it is to be an entrepreneur. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm not saying that not to hire like a design person or a PR person, but you can be creative. Some of it you can do yourself, some of it you can contract. Maybe you hire a part-time person. Maybe you find somebody who's an intern. But as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for creative solutions that may not cost you a lot of money because you're trying to be as careful as you can. Um, but I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying, you know, think of the alternatives to hiring a traditional agency to help you. Hi, Mark. First of all, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, it was really good content. Um, you, you talked a little bit about creating these magnets where you know, using the inbound marketing concept you're really directing people to your, to your assets, your web assets and other properties. Could you talk a little bit about how you could leverage those as well as other inbound marketing concepts to get insights from customers as to what's working and what's not working and then you know, adjusting your, your strategy based on that? Right, I mean, one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs forget is that they're fo focused on what they're doing is they fail to look at the target audiences and what they want. Um, and often, sometimes what you do, they don't want it all, and you have to pivot. Um, and so there's lots of, um, I mean, one of the ways is just, is just, I mean, I'll give you an example. And with social media, you'll find that some of your users are more engaged than others, um, and that you can actually sort of uh, build relationships with certain users and then invite them into the tent. And I think as an entrepreneur, what you can't be afraid of is letting people inside your tent. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs are very protective of their idea or their product, or their company because of you know, competitive intelligence. But I think what you want to do is you want to ask your customers. You may want to go direct. You know, when you get a customer or a potential customer, you want me, and it doesn't work out, or maybe they become a customer, ask them, so why did you become a customer? You know, what was it about us that made you pick us versus the competition? Or you lose a deal, and you may ask them just out of curiosity, you know, what was it about us that you didn't like? I think we're afraid to ask those questions to customers. Um, and you're always looking for intelligence, and whether you get it through uh, polls that you do, or maybe you do a, a survey monkey kind of thing, or whether you do social media to solicit feedback, is that you just have to ask, I think, and really be sort of you know, progressive in terms of what you do. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, my question is about uh, networking events. Uh, Toronto Board of Trades and other Board of Trades have uh, some events that I, some of them are free, some of them cost uh, some money. Right. Uh, what is your your view on those events? Are they useful to find leads? Uh, what are they useful in, in your case? Uh, we got to pick which ones to go to. So I was talking to, to uh, Carrie earlier about uh, about going to all these events. And if, the truth is, I don't go to a lot of social media or web events. Um, the, pro the problem is that the people that are at those events are already drinking the Kool-Aid. So the stuff that I have to sell, they already know. So what you want to think about when you're networking is, is what you want out of those networking events. So if you're trying to build relationships and you're trying to sort of build your stature within the industry, then go to industry events that are relevant to what you're doing. But if you're trying to find customers, you may want to go to events that are not particularly in your industry but are related. Um, because I think the thing about networking events is they suck up a lot of time. Um, and that, as an entrepreneur, you're working enough hours as it is, and so you really got to pick. So where do I want to spe spend those extra hours? Like if I want to go to an event, is it worth the time, which is your most important asset, and also you know, when it comes to money, right? Is that you're going to go to a conference, go to a conference and pick the one you think you're getting the most bang for the buck. You got to be, I, I think conferences, like I run a conference, um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that as an entrepreneur, you, you can't afford them, really. So if you go, you go to like go to ones that you think you're going to get a lot out of, um, and then you know, and just and when you go to a networking events, you can't be a wallflower. You just got to be out there, right? You got to have your business cards, and you got to be shaking hands and kissing babies, and you know, getting as much sort of, you know, out of it as you can. Um, but I, I think you should be very selective. I think that's the only way you're going to survive. Yeah. I was just wondering if you have any tips for how to build up followers using Twitter. Well, if you follow every single person who follows you, then you'll get them. <laughs> um, well, I think the thing that you gotta, you gotta ask yourself, um, whether it comes to Twitter or Facebook, is what does it matter? So why does quantity matter over quality? I mean, a number is a number. So I've got a client um, that says, okay, we're doing a Facebook page and we want 6,000 fans in the first three months. And it's like, well, why? Well, where did 6,000 come from? And I, I think you have to ask yourself, so what, the first question is, well, why is it important? And if it is important to you, then I think the key, uh, and this comes from my days as a journalist, is that content is king. And I think the three things that you gotta think about when it comes to social media are educate, enlighten, or entertain. So if you keep on doing things that hit one of those three things, then that'll start to build your audience because it, it, I think that people want stuff that's valuable in social media. Um, they want you to be giving them things that make their lives easier, better, they can learn new things or get new insight. And, and maybe that's the core, and maybe it's a matter of you having to follow lots of people to get lots of people to follow you back. It's not necessarily something I do, um, but at the end of the day, I think you just have to you know, be very active and produce great stuff and then see what happens. Could you just repeat what you said, educate, enlighten, and, and entertain. entertain? The three E's. Thanks. Okay, last question. As an entrepreneur, when you're starting out and you're looking for a PR firm, would you recommend we go for someone who is going to generate a lot of quantity, or um, should we go for the quality? Because I know on, on Facebook, Tumblr, a lot of the mediums are very fast, and it's, and it's going to gain you, gain you publicity to have yourself up at the top of the news feed, and that comes from generating a lot. Right, but so. But sometimes you don't have the stuff. Um, so when you're looking for a PR agency, you gotta figure out what, what's your budget, and what's your area of expertise, and how can they meet those needs, um, because, um, Big agencies are going to cost you maybe 200 bucks an hour, um, but an independent might cost you 100 dollars an hour. So that's that's one. Somebody who's you know maybe worked for an agency, but they've got their own shop now. So that's one. Second is, do they have the connections and the relationships in the marketplaces that you want to go after? So if, for example, if you're I don't know you're you're selling toys, that you want somebody who's got good retail experience and good connections with toy makers. Um, and then you've got to make sure that they can um, help you create, craft your stories. I mean, those are the three keys. Um, to go to a big agency, and because they've, you know, they've got a big name and they've got lots of people, it doesn't guarantee they're going to do the job for you. Um, and that, um, I think, it really comes down to who's going to do the best job for you and, and getting a feel for that. Um, and I don't, I, you know, whether it's, it's quantity or quality, uh, you know, I think that, I think that 
quality at the end of the day is, is what you want. You want good, solid coverage about your company and what they do. So if, I'd, I'd much rather have two or three really solid newspaper hits and, some, and a little bit of blog coverage than a lot of sort of blog coverage that just sort of comes and goes. Um, you know, one of the funny things about PR when it comes to the media is that we're so focused on social media and blogs that we forget about the power of the media. You know, getting a feature story in the front page of the business section of the Toronto Star is like hitting the jackpot, right? Um, and, you know, that's something you can sort of put on your website and you can leverage. Getting some blog coverage often doesn't last that long. So I would go for quality. And good stories. Have, you have to have good stories. Yeah, one last question, I guess. Um, so I just wanted to talk about um, igniting your market analysis and market research, getting that started for a new product, a new service, a new idea. So as an entrepreneur, we're often seeing opportunities and need, needs in the marketplace. And you ask yourself, why hasn't this need been met or filled? And you want to do market analysis to find out what your tar which target market will give you your greatest ROI. Right. You might create a survey or so-and-so, but then how do you get people to fill that survey out to answer those questions when you are now just developing your product and don't actually have something yet to put in front of people and say, come and use this service or use this product. So how do you get people to give you their feedback just so that, just for product development and service development? Right, you know, I, I would ask them. And, uh, I, you know, surveys are, are fine, and, uh, but often, you know, they, I think people give them a lot more credit than probably what they're worth. But uh, I have a client who's developing a new product, like a little, it's a tangential business to what his core business is. And the way that he's actually figuring out whether people want it is that he's going to trade shows and saying, hey, what if I created a service that did this and offered this kind of benefits? What would you think? And so what he's demonstrating is that he's actually, like we often sort of keep our, our new ideas to ourselves, and we develop them sort of in a very insular way because we don't want anybody else to find out what we're doing. But we have no market intelligence. There's no outside perspective of whether it's a good idea or not, whether it resonates. But I think, you know, there's, no matter how good your idea is, there's going to be somebody else out there with a similar idea. And their idea could be better or they could be a little bit different. Um, but there's always competition. So I don't think you can be afraid of trying to protect your idea. And the best way to get feedback is to go to places where potential customers might be and saying, hey, listen, can I, bet, you know, can I spare five minutes of your time? I've got this idea for a product. What do you think? Real life feedback. You know, that it'll, you'll get much better results, much better feedback than you will from any survey that you'll create. So I think, I think that's the, the simple answer. Don't be afraid of, of sharing your good idea. Thanks, Mark. That was great. All right. Thank you.